so first of all, I'll reiterate my congratu congratulations to uh, Molly for this uh, I think quite prestigious uh, uh, chair, and and certainly thank her very much for the privilege of uh, being able to uh, to join you uh, from the animal breeding field. I'm always a bit impressed when I get to the world of the real scientists here. So, and, and uh, I have to apologize because I will give a talk about something that has been uh, published. So we have work going on in a big pedigree that where we try to study the process of the novo mutation. Uh, but I've told to some of you before about this uh, mosaic thing. And so we are in the midst of analyzing the data. And, and I thought it would be more interesting for the audience to, in fact, go back to another mutational process that we run into while uh, uh, studying cows, and which I think is a fun story. And, and if some of you read the literature as bad as I do, you probably missed it. So, so I'll, I'll tell you something uh, new for you. So, so, so I, I work quite a bit with uh, livestock, including uh, cows. And so since domestication, clearly breeders have been attracted by what they call fancy animals. And that can actually go from how how birds sing to whether they have horns or not, but coat color clearly is an important thing, uh, obviously, that is attracting the attention of the breeders. And there's a thing called uh, uh, color-sidedness in, uh, in, uh, in English. In Flemish, it's called witrig, uh, which, which means uh, white background. So these are animals that have these uh, uh, unpigmented patterns along their, mainly along their uh, uh, spine. And the thing is, it's a very old, so it's going to be a little bit of a surprise to see because I have the wrong presentation, but uh, so we'll, oh God, and this, this thing doesn't seem to work here. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very old thing. So in this presentation, I don't have it, but I, I, I found a painting from a Dutch city, and it must go back to 1200 or something, where you see a market and you see these witric animals. So they've been there for some time. And another indication of the fact that it's an old thing is I had a chance to travel the Silk Road on my motorbike and you know I could see these witric animals all over the place, even in, in the Pamir in Tajikistan. And at some point I see these yaks and, and while we were working on that, they were color-sided yaks. So another indication that it's a, a, a very old thing. And what you see here, are a series of breeds, mainly European, where uh, the same or apparently the same phenotype is being uh, uh, is present. And one of the postdocs in the lab, Carole Charlier, in you know, who really she's a real vet, she likes cows, and she said, I, "I want to study this thing." And I said, "You know, well, keep losing your time. You know, I, I wouldn't do it. You know, you're going to hit a, one of these uh, genes that has been well documented of, effect, of uh, affecting melanoma." melanocyte uh, uh, biology, but it's unlikely there's going to be something really interesting coming out of that. And I've said that many times, pretty much every, every time I said that there was something really interesting coming out. And so that's what I want to share with you. So this is our local Belgian breed where we have this phenotype, and Carole decides that she's going to uh, study that. So she collects uh, DNA from animals with the phenotypes and controls. I won't go into the details, but you have to do that a bit carefully because there's another locus segregating in the breed that is apistatic. So if you want to do things clearly, you have to select your cases and controls from a subset of the population where you can see the signal properly. And we did an association study under a dominant model. So we know that this phenotype uh, is visible in, uh, in heterozygotes. So we take animals with the phenotype and we, we look at the presence of a haplotype on at least one of the two homologues in all the individuals that are uh, uh, having this phenotype. And so what we, what we see is this very strong, well, reasonably strong, at least it's coming clearly outside of the noise, signal on uh, an autosome uh, chromosome uh, 9. And so this is the way Carol looks at these things. So what you see here is on the left, uh, uh, the animals with the phenotype, on the right, animals that are controls. And essentially you see a bounce there in which there are no green spots. It just means that this is a locus where none of the animals with the phenotype are alternate homozygotes A, A and B, B, which is the signal you expect. And so she, she maps quite convincingly the, the culprit gene and mutation to chromosome 29, where the arrow lies. 
She looks at what's in there. There's only one gene in there, a, a fairly large gene, but the, there's nothing that allows us to make a link between melanocyte uh, biology and this gene. And in fact, this project ends up in one of the drawers of the lab, like many other uh, uh, projects. And then Keith Durkin comes along to study something completely different in the lab. He's going to study copy number variation. So a very boring project where you say, why don't you study copy number variation in the bovine and see whether this thing contributes to, has an effect on the economically important traits that we are looking at. And we have a very big database, you know, now hundreds of thousands of animals that have genotypes. And he starts with pen CNV and the, the SNP genotypes. We have to look for CNVs. And of course, he hits uh, lots of CNVs. And you know, the, we start to be lucky there, because he has this, uh, this signal there, which you see on the left, where there's evidence for a, a copy number variant spanning the kit gene, which we know very well is one of the genes that comes up when you look at coat color uh, variation. And you know, he, he has these five animals that have the, this peculiar CNV, and he's in the same office as Caron, and says, you know, what are these animals here in the database? And she said, God, you know, these are my, my uh, Wittrick animals. These are the animals with uh, color-sidedness. And, and so they have this discrepant results that Carol, a few months before, has a strong linkage association on chromosome 29, while Keith has a copy number variant on chromosome 6 encompassing the uh, kit gene. And they confirm the uh, copy number variant on tiling arrays. They do uh, comparative genome hybridization. And you see this very clear signal that marks 480 KB of a uh, duplicated uh, region. And Keith is a very po good postdoc. So it takes him an evening. And he said, well, you know, we always have this tendency to consider that when we have a copy number variant, the second copy has to sit next to the original one. But that's, of course, not uh, necessarily the case. So he says, well, it's very possible that the copy we see in this slide here actually moved to chromosome 29. And he is a cytogeneticist, so he does very quickly an experiment in one of these carrier animals using bugs that are respectively going to the chromosome 6, let's say, copy number variants, and the regional chromosome 29, where we have found the association. And he finds this beautiful signal where he actually he demonstrates that, indeed, the second copy of the chromosome 6 segment moved to chromosome 29 in these animals. He said, OK, that's uh, nice. And I would say, well, we, we, it would be good to publish that in animal genetics. No, so we better have the breakpoints of this uh, rearrangement. And we generate mate pair libraries with 5KB inserts to try to identify the breakpoints more uh, accurately. And so, in fact, the signal we are expecting is shown here. So the blue thing is uh, chromosome 6. I'm already putting, uh, let's say, reference points within the duplicated segment A, B, C, D, E. And the green chromosome is chromosome 29. And I assume that the blue segment is going to be inserted between what I call alpha and beta. So that the prediction is that we are going to have discordant mate pairs of the kind shown there. So going to the extremities of the, uh, let's say, uh, segments that are moving. But as usually, you know, you, you have some expectation, but that's not what you observe in the data. So we do indeed find discordant mates, but the pattern is much more complex than we anticipated. Uh, so that's what we find. But in fact, again, you know, Keith, you look, look at that, and the whole thing is actually quite easily reconcilable with the hypothesis that there has been a rearrangement of A, B, C, D, E. You know, we just have uh, something that is due to a circularization. So, so this mutation here, according to us, or it's an, a, a parsimonious explanation to say that there is a piece of chromosome 6 encompassing kit that is excised. You have a circularization. And then when this, this circle is going to reinsert in chromosome 29, it reopens at another spot than where it was initially ligated prior to uh, integration. So God, we say, well, that's kind of a nice result. We might even try better than animal genetics. Um, for those of you that are interested, uh, um, uh, 
Lupski has studied this kind of rearrangement in the human extensively. And, and uh, so if you look at the precise sequence at the uh, breakpoint, you, know, you, you could imagine that this might be mediated by uh, repetitive elements. But in fact, although all the breakpoints happen in repetitive sequences in this specific case, there are non-homologous sequences. So this has nothing to do with just recombination between, let's say, non-allelic but identical sequences. This looks more like a thing that is called uh, um, microhomology mediated break induced uh, repair or also FOSTES, it, it seems to be linked to blockage in the replication for that is due to lesions in the, in the DNA that has to be replicated. So it, it's characterized by a pattern of microhomology, micro duplications and uh, micro uh, deletions. So, you know, we have colleagues that are also interested in cows with beautiful gold colors. And while we were doing this, Tosso Leib from uh, the University of Bern is doing something similar in his favorite uh, breed in Switzerland, so-called brown Swiss, where you see animals with a similar pattern. And what you see here is that the expressivity is a bit stronger in the homozygous on the left versus the heterozygous on the, uh, on the right. And <clears throat> so what we quickly do with him is do a mapping experiment, and so this is the pedigree that was used, and it's done with the same arrays. And in, in this case, uh, the linkage is going very strongly to chromosome 6, containing kids. So we say, well, this is different than Belgian blue, uh, because we mapped, it to, we, we mapped the, the, the culprit mutation to chromosome 29. So here it's going to chromosome 6, but it's making perfect sense, because the kit locus uh, is uh, there. And when we look at the SNP data for copy number variation, we have this evidence again for a, a copy number variation, which we clean up on the nimble gen uh, tiling arrays. So we have 120 KB here, uh, uh, duplication if you want, that does not encompass the kitchen. The, the little arrow there is the location of the kitchen, but if I was to superimpose that on the duplication of Belgian blue, we would see that it would sit within. So it, it's, it's within the boundaries of the previous duplication. So you know, at first glance, you say this, has, uh, this is an independent event. But then you know, when Keith goes and looks at the chromosome 29, which gladly he, he did, he sees something that again we can clean up. And in fact, he sees this duplication of chromosome 29 and the left-hand side of the gray region there, which corresponds to the duplication, is exactly where the Belgian blue segment was introduced. So we say, God, you know, the, it, the, if you map it, which is you, you map the causative mutation, it's going somewhere else. But this is sort of generating a first link with the other uh, allele. And so, so what we because we had identified the breakpoints in the Belgian blue uh, mutation, where we had essentially three breakpoints, the two flanking green, blue, and then the within blue uh, duplication. We can test whether they are present in this other breed. And one of the three uh, breakpoints is present in the, uh, in, the, um, in the brown tree. So you say, God, you know, so the, these two things are uh, related. So uh, Keith is doing uh, in situ hybridization. And in this case, what he shows is that the piece of chromosome 29 that is shown to be duplicated on the nimble generase, this time moved to chromosome uh, 6. So we, we generate mate pair libraries. We sequence these things. And we look in detail at the patterns. And essentially, I think what's coming out is quite clearly. So the mutation that we do find in this brown Swiss is derived from the Belgian blue allele by a process in which, again, there is a piece of chromosome that is excised, probably due to random double-stranded breaks or something like that. There is a, and, and so this, in this case, what the piece encompasses is a piece of the translocated chromosome segment, uh, chromosome 6 segment in the first allele with flanking chromosome 29 sequences. You have recircularization, and then this thing re comes back home 
reintegrating the original locus by a process which we think is just standard homologous recombination. And we tested so the hypothesis of uh, standard homologous recombination. We can't test it you know, full proof, but at least the prediction is that in this newly generated allele, the haplotype of the flanking C and B segments should be exactly the same as in the Belgian blue allele. And so we, we scan for polymorphisms, and that's indeed what we find. So we haven't really mapped precisely the breakpoints, but uh, you know, uh, all the SNPs that we, we can ascertain here, that we can uh, study here, you know, confirm the fact that it's the same uh, haplotype. That's what's, uh, what is shown here. And again, you know, it's uh, uh, at least the, the uh, excision here could be due to this uh, MMBR uh, mechanism. And so, so because we have samples from, uh, from uh, all over the place, so we test uh, all the animals from all over the world that have this phenotype. And in fact, what we see is something that I hope is summarized well here. So we see some breeds that have the, the Belgian blue allele, some breeds that have the, the brown Swiss allele, and some, some breeds that have, in fact, both alleles present uh, uh, in their genome, including these uh, yaks. Uh, what you have to know is that yak can uh, breed with cows, so there has been hybridization going on between Bostaurus and, uh, and uh, yak. Um, so, just another thing, it's a, it's a dominant phenotype, so, so you, you expect some sort of gain of function uh, mutation, so, so sort of our prediction was that to explain the dominance, the kit allele that is present on the translocated segment, for instance, in Belgian blue, should be transcription competent. And so we tested that, and that's indeed the case. And if we look at the messenger RNA structure of kits uh, transcribed from the mutant allele, that, so it, it has a perfectly uh, normal uh, set of isoforms. So in fact, and I hope I have that here. So what we think is happening is that uh, it's, there, there's a disruption of the regulation of kit expression from what we think are these uh, regulatory elements here. So the kit gene is located here, and if you look at uh, marks that uh, define the presence of uh, enhancers, say, well, there's, there are two very strong uh, signatures uh, here, and in all the mutations, and I don't know whether the slide here shows that, Essentially, what is happening is that the relationship between the, the kit gene and these regulatory elements is perturbed. So, uh, in, in this case, the brown Swiss case, this chromosome 29P actually separates the gene from its enhancers, while here, while the enhancers were downstream, they are being placed upstream. And we have one other example now of a mutation, but because I took the wrong presentation, I don't have the slides where we have another breed where we have to find a third element and, and it is not linked to this bubble thing, but uh, it at least is compatible with the enhancers in the DE segment playing an important uh, role. Okay, so you know, we thought that's, that's a cool thing, right? So we have these, it seems like chromosomes are sending out bubbles that go integrate somewhere else in the genome, which is fun, but you know, they come back home with souvenirs, you know, and, and, uh, and these souvenirs potentially contain uh, exons. So the question is, is this a completely bizarre thing, you know, which will never be found again and, and, and uh, is not important uh, beyond cows? But in fact, if you go through the literature, there is, and an, this should be a French story actually, but it's not, it's Australian. Um, so, if you, people that play with uh, yeast producing wine have uh, a similar thing going on. So, there is, there is a polymorphism in these populations which are due to the fact that a piece of segment has moved around the genome by the same uh, mechanism. And in fact, if you look at some cancers, you have strong evidence of amplification that involves similar mechanisms, and I'm, I'll be done in a minute. So what we've started to do is to say, well, can we find other examples of that sort of to convince ourselves that this is important from an evolutionary point of view? And so we're not very far with that, but what, what, what you can easily do is you can take human data, for instance, with SNPs, you can call CNVs, and then you have a, you have a series of CNVs for which you have 
individual genotypes, and then you can do an association between that genotype and the rest of the genome. So you can actually look where the copied segment has gone into the genome. And if it's true that in the majority of cases these things coincide, because you have the classical CNV where the second copy stayed next door of its origin, you have a whole bunch, in fact, where you can map these uh, CNVs, which are due to a translocated segment. So these are examples in other examples in human and bovine, you know, for which we would like to know whether, if we go and look in detail at these alleles, whether there might be the signature of a circular uh, intermediate. And, and so it's a, sort of tempting. So the, the original presentation started with exon shuffling. You know? So we all read in our textbooks, you know, and we probably teach exon shuffling theory, which is derived from the fact that we see this sharing of protein uh, domains between different proteins. And then the question is, you know, how does this thing actually happen? And so it's tempting sort of to speculate that this might be one of the mechanisms that is actually used for uh, exon shuffling. And uh, I have to thank especially Carole Charlie and uh, Keith Durkin for this uh, study.